All right, here we are, the uh, book of Colossians uh, for beginners. This is lesson 12. This is the final lesson in the series. Uh, final lesson in the series on book of Colossians. And I want to thank uh, everybody uh, for participating in uh, this study, your steady uh, attendance and attention. Uh, I certainly hope that this uh, class has been a blessing to you in building up your faith in Jesus Christ and making you more secure in your salvation. Certainly those who are here while we're filming these classes and those individuals watching uh, later on, uh, watching online or uh, getting the, uh, the video a little bit later on to take the class. I said that when we began this study that the focal point of this epistle was Jesus Christ. His supremacy, His preeminence, this is the point of this letter to the Colossians. So in our closing review lessons, let's go back to this important theme, shall we? So open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. So let me, for one last time, do a bit of a review, the background review. In writing to the Colossian brethren, Paul the Apostle describes the supremacy of Christ to a church who had begun to kind of drift away from the faith and drift away from its original teaching. Uh, false teachers had crept in and began teaching a gospel that they had mixed together. Uh, they began with Greek philosophical ideas. They mixed in pagan cultic practices such as the worship of angels. They added Jewish religious traditions and married all of this with the teachings of Christianity. It was a form of synergism. Synergism in religion is when you bring together various elements from other religions to create a religion or you add to an existing religion ideas from other religions. And that's what they were trying to do with Christianity. So these men blended all of these components into a new gospel, which they claimed would give people a more dynamic spiritual experience. So instead of faith practiced in loving obedience as Jesus had taught, they promoted a strict form of asceticism. In other words, the denial of certain foods, vows of celibacy and so on and so forth. And they were telling their followers that this would provide the spiritual power needed to gain the salvation that they, that they wanted. This type of teaching and practice was clearly in opposition to the gospel. And so in response to these heresies, Paul puts forth two main ideas in his epistle to the Colossian church. Main idea number one, it is Jesus who is supreme. It is Jesus who is preeminent. It is Jesus, not these teachers, not their new methods, not any person who is superior, only Jesus Christ. And in chapter one, uh, beginning in verse 15, Paul you know, summarizes this idea. He says, he, speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. So in stating this fact, Paul describes seven areas of Jesus' supremacy. First of all, he says, Jesus is supreme in spirit, in verse 15a. As the image of God, He is God. No other spirit invented by man is His equal. Secondly, He holds the supreme position that Paul says in verse 15b, no created thing is before Him in time or in position. Number three, He is the supreme authority, verse 16. Every level of creation from the unseen particles to the greatest king or leader is subject to His authority. Not only His authority is greater, but every other authority is in service to His authority. Paul also states that Jesus is the supreme reason for existence, verse 16b. He is the answer to every great question and the end of every search. 
Number five, Paul says that Jesus is the supreme power in verse 17. It is by His energy that the physical world continues to exist. Not gravity, not black holes, not exploding galaxies. He is the power source for all of the things that exists. He holds all these things together. Number six, Jesus is the supreme head of organized religion on earth. Verse 18a, you know, he's head of the body. Only Jesus, by virtue of his supremacy, has a right to be worshiped by God, uh, as God, rather. He and only he is the true religious and spiritual head. All others are pretenders or false prophets. And then finally, in this, you know, just three verses, he says all of this. Finally, he says, Jesus is the supreme leader of the eternal kingdom of heaven. Uh, in the spiritual world, he is the leader of the angels and spirit beings that were created before us, as well as the supreme leader of those who have joined them from the earthly realm since. In the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is the Lord of all forever. Now, after establishing Jesus' supreme position in all of these areas, Paul explains one other important fact about Jesus that they need to be reminded of. So let's not lose the thread here. He's saying, first of all, Jesus is preeminent. He's supreme. Okay, that's the, the first idea that he gets across. The second idea that he gets across is that Jesus, this supreme Lord, sacrificed himself for them, for us, in verses 19 and 20. Let's read verses 19 and 20. He says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So Paul's point here is, uh, who needs human philosophy? Who needs cultural rituals and human effort when the Supreme Lord that he described you know, in the previous verses, this Supreme Lord has personally undertaken the task of saving those who were condemned to death by sin. Why would you need anything or anyone else when you have this person with these qualifications, this individual uh, 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 making the effort to save you? So no amount of human wisdom and effort could accomplish what the Supreme Lord had accomplished for them. And of course, you know, by extension, for them and for us. It's the same Supreme Lord. He does the same task on our behalf in our day and in our age. So Paul finishes this section by reminding them of three things. If they accept what he has taught them, you know, that Jesus is you know, preeminent, supreme, and that this same Jesus died for them to save them. If, if they accept these things, then they need to remember three important ideas. Number one, remember the way you were saved. In verse 21 and 22, he says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So remember the way you were saved. He explains that their sins against God are what made them guilty and subject to condemnation and punishment, eternal punishment in hell. But, he goes on to say, it was the blood of Jesus, the Supreme One, that washed away their guilt that made them pure before God. And so the cross, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus, all these things interchangeable, all talking about the same thing. This is what makes them pure. This is what makes them beyond the reach of Satan. This is what makes them acceptable to God. Not self-sacrifice and self-denial or learning all kinds of mysteries that are couched in you know, a, a, a human religion and, 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 and man-made ideas. Those things, they're not going to help you uh, uh, to remove the guilt uh, of sin on your conscience. Only the cross of Christ can do that. So the, remember the way you were saved. Number two, he says, remember to remain faithful. In verse 23a, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established 
and steadfast. Note that he says, if, this is a condition, if God's grace is free, we cannot buy it, we cannot earn it, we cannot sell it, we cannot obtain it based on our conditions. We can't demand it, we can't beg for it, we can't do that. We cannot produce it or force God to give it to us based on our effort, our wisdom, or our actions. That's a little bit what the false teachers were proposing here. If you do these extremely difficult things, denying yourself and you know, uh, learn the mysteries and worship, you know, if you do those things, then you know, you'll receive this grace. But no, there's nothing we do to earn the grace of God. God is the one that sets the conditions for grace. He's the one who establishes the one criteria for its procurement, and that one criteria is faith. Faith in the human heart, that's what is necessary in order to obtain grace. So you can only obtain this wonderful soul cleansing grace through faith, and that faith is expressed according to His will and purpose. So grace is free, but it's not given to scoffers and disbelievers and those who, are, those who are disobedient. If it was, then sinners and disbelievers like Herod, for example, and Hitler and Stalin, these people would be with Christ this very moment, even though they hated Him and His church during their lifetime. No, grace is extended to those who have faith and in Colossians chapter 2, 11 and 12, Paul further explains that faith in Christ is properly expressed in baptism. So let's jump over to Colossians chapter 2, shall we? Verse 11 and 12, it says, And in Him you were also circumcised without a, with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. So in Colossians, Paul is simply repeating what Peter explained to the Jews in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday. Remember that verse? Uh, if we go to Acts chapter uh, two, when the crowd, after Peter had finished preaching the sermon, his sermon, Pentecost Day sermon, the crowd asked him, so what do we do? How can we be saved? And so it says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And what does Peter say? He has the opportunity here to say anything, right? So what does the Spirit give him to say? He said, Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He could have said anything there. Could have set any precedent. What does he say to them? They need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. So um, the pilgrim gate, very interesting. Some people say, well, you know, how, how, could they, you know, how could they baptize people there? They were in the city. They weren't at the Jordan. They weren't at the Jordan River. And, they, and you know, the book of Acts says 3,000 people were baptized. How, how is that possible? And one answer to that, of course, is that um, uh, Peter was preaching near the pilgrim gate. They had different gates that led into the city, led into the city of Jerusalem. And the pilgrim gate was the place where pilgrims, individuals from other nations and so on and so forth, would come to Jerusalem for the high holy days, for the festivals, in this case for the Pentecost feasts. And at the pilgrim gate there were pools of water there where the pilgrims would bathe and, and, and cleanse themselves and wash their feet and all that kind of stuff before they would enter into the holy city. And so where is Peter on Pentecost Sunday? Well, he's at the pilgrim gate and he's preaching to this, the, the thousands of people that have gathered in the city at that time for the Pentecost feast. So when it came time to be baptized, what do you think happened? How do you think they used those pools of water that were conveniently there for the pilgrims to bathe? So there was nothing different about the water, but now that washing, that cleansing, that baptism, that immersion took on a new significance as it was done by faith and through faith in Jesus Christ. And so from a very practical perspective, I've seen, you know, people say, well, how can you baptize 3,000 people? Well, if you have 12 apostles, you know, a huge body of water there, 
you could baptize 3,000 people in an hour or two. That, that, could, that, that could happen. It's not beyond you know, thinking or imagination. And so Paul reminds them, we go back to Colossians now, Paul reminds them to remain faithful, assured that the grace of God to remove all of their sins was applied completely when they called on the name of Jesus in repentance and baptism. Not in fasting, not in denying their bodies, not in denying themselves marriage, not in eating certain foods and not eating certain foods, you know, not in being circumcised, not in the worship of angels, not in the search for mysterious religious ideas. Those are not the things that remove sins. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, you want to remove your sins? Repent and be baptized. And that same message, that same response to people has remained the same for 2,000 years. People, what must I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Paul simply confirms this idea in the Colossian letter. And then finally he says to them, remember the true gospel. The true gospel, in verse 23b he says, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So the danger they were facing was that with their false teachings, these men were moving these people away from the original gospel message. You see, not only were they taking in new information, not only were they taking in false ideas for themselves, the danger is that they were then going to go out and spread these false ideas. So in doing this, they were moving away from Christ because Christ is, is the same as His gospel. Not only would they move away from Christ, but in spreading these things, they would sabotage the faith of, of other people. So Paul tells them to remember Christ, He's the only supreme one, not these teachers. Um, the cross of Christ, the only way to forgiveness and perfection, vicarious atonement, Jesus pays the price for us. We cannot pay the price in any way, shape, or form. And thirdly, remember His gospel. Remember the message. Remember how it is to be preached because it's the only message that is to be preached and it's the only message that has hope. If they did this, the Supreme Lord Jesus would remain their personal Savior and Lord forever. So as we close out you know, the end of this study and move on you know, to other areas of study, I encourage all of us here uh, and those who are listening, of course, online, other places, I encourage everyone with the same encouragement of Paul. I don't give any different encouragement. Same encouragement, perhaps in different words. I encourage you to hold on to Christ. He is the supreme Lord of all persons, all dominions, worlds, and events. Even the events of today, we look at the events of the past as if they're like a movie or something that didn't happen, but these people lived during a time, a tumultuous time, the Roman Empire, slavery, you know, all kinds of things were going on. Today, all kinds of things are going on, right? Wars, rumors of wars, conflict, a society that's changing, values, so on, you know, moral, uh, the moral we believe in our nation, the level of morality is, is, is going down, respect for authority, respect for law, respect for the Bible going. You know, we live at our time in history and it is tumultuous and it is challenging. Same message, hold on to Christ, hold on to Christ. Wars, climate changes, economic upheavals, whatever, He is still the Supreme Lord. Hold on to that. Jesus will save you. Jesus will sustain you and surround you with His love forever. So hold on to Him. And, and if you're saying, well, but it's becoming so difficult to live in this world, all the greater reason why you should hold on more tightly to Him. Number two, I encourage you, hold on to the cross of Christ. You know, there's, there's going to be all kinds of new prophets, new teachings, new promises. It happens in every generation. There's always something new coming along, some new hybrid form of Christianity that promises to be more effective, you know, more with the times. 
But no matter what, hold on to the cross of Jesus because that's the heart and soul of our faith. When you feel you're unworthy, when you're afraid that all is lost, hold on to the cross of Jesus as the one act in all of history that will serve to save you and keep you saved forever. Hold on to the cross. And then finally, well, number three, hold on to the gospel of Jesus. You know, technology changes and society changes, but people are the same today as the day Adam sinned. God preached the gospel to Adam because it was the answer to his problem of sin and it remains the answer to sinful man today. You know, yes, we have advanced technology, we have the internet, we have phones that can do everything, you know, we have phones that can drive our cars, <laughs> right? But the human heart remains exactly the same as it was uh, during the time that Cain murdered Abel out of jealousy and envy. Have those, th have those things changed? No, they haven't changed at all. The human heart remains the same. And so the gospel of Jesus addresses the human heart. Now we use different technology to deliver it, of course, but the message is always the same. Let's not allow the technology to change the message. All right? The message remains the same for all time. So let's not change the gospel and certainly let's not be ashamed of it. You know, thinking, oh, there must be something cooler or newer that will, that will appeal to the modern generation, to the millennials and so on and so forth. No, the millennials and every generation that comes after them have exactly the same issue. It's a sin issue. It's a sin problem. And only the gospel deals with the sin issue and the sin problem. Let us instead take every advantage that technology has given us to proclaim the glorious gospel to every sinner on earth. And when we do that, we're following the, uh, the task that Jesus has given uh, his disciples. And then one more, hold on to each other in Christ. You know, the, 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 the world is filled with unbelievers and scoffers, evil men and women, and Satan's willing servants. Because of this, Christians need each other. So let's not hurt each other. Let's forgive and be kind to those for whom Christ died and within whom the Holy Spirit resides. Remember, in the church, you're not the only one that has the Holy Spirit. Other people have the Holy Spirit too. You're not the only one that loves the Lord. Other people love the Lord too. And you're not the only one that needs, you know, you know, cut me some slack, I'm not perfect. Well, everybody else is like that. They need to have a little slack, if you wish because they're not perfect either. So let, let's make the, the loving of, of each other uh, the main priority in the church. I've said it in other, uh, you know, other contexts. The, the preaching of the gospel is what brings people into the body, into the church, but it's loving one another that maintains our faith, that keeps us in the church and keeps us motivated. Um, if we make love the main priority of the church, this will be pleasing to the Lord Jesus and it will promote the best witness of our faith uh, in Him. OK, so that's the end of our study of Colossians. As I said, I, I hope this study has been uh, edifying for you. I hope that it strengthened your faith in Jesus Christ uh, and lifted Him up before you uh, and that you will be uh, even more confident in your faith as you go forward. Thank you very much and God bless you.